Joe Biden's promise for a bipartisan COVID relief bill has hit a few roadblocks already with Senator Manchin, one of those roadblocks, Sagar. Yeah, that's right. And as the new president backpedals on his promise for $2,000 checks, millions of Americans still filing for unemployment. So former National Press Secretary for the Bernie Sanders campaign, contributing editor at Current Affairs and host of the Bad Faith podcast, our friend Brianna Joy Gray, she joins us now to discuss. Brianna, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you both. Brianna, let's talk about this. Now, there's this new Democratic effort our friend Jeff Stein has reported on about possibly lowering the income thresholds from 75000 to 50000 Immediately comes to mind this is based on 2019 tax returns, not on anything that just happened within this year. So it seems like a very misguided effort at quote-unquote targeting. Yeah, so what you're talking about here is going from a plan that will cover 95% of Americans to a plan that will cover 70% of Americans. And let's all keep in mind what the point of all of this is. The point of these stimulus checks is, yes, to keep people economically afloat while businesses, jobs have been lost, um, businesses have shut down because of COVID, but also to incentivize people to stay home so that we can get COVID under control faster and reopen the economy faster the way that other countries like Australia and New Zealand have managed to do. So what you're talking about when you're saying fewer and fewer people are going to receive stimulus checks, not only are you undermining the promise that was made, especially in the contests in Georgia, to send people $2,000 checks, you're also really undermining the COVID response, which of course was supposed to be one of the main reasons we wanted to elect Joe Biden, because he understood science and hopefully understood the economics that are required to follow the scientific um, requirement to get, to get people to stay home and stay safe until the pandemic is under control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Brianna, I mean, one thing that's encouraging is they've started moving forward with budget reconciliation. You've got Manchin out there saying, OK, he'll go along with that. But he opposes the $15 minimum wage hike. But let's say that they get everything in this $1.9 trillion plan, which is supported by such leftists as the Republican billionaire governor of West Virginia. Um, what do you think of the $1.9 trillion? Do you think it's sufficient? Do you think that it has good things in it? Do you think that it doesn't go far enough? Like if they actually get that plan through and do it through budget reconciliation, what is your evaluation or assessment of that? Yeah, the issue is that there are so many people under such stress right now, Crystal, that it's hard for anyone to argue against a plan of any amount. You saw this in the lead up to the election, right? There was a really good argument that Nancy Pelosi had fumbled the ball and not taken the larger by nearly double uh, Republican plan Mm -hmm. that was on the table prior to the election. Um, But at the same time, no one really wants to argue with a smaller plan once it's on the table, given the kind of crisis that people are experiencing right now. And that is the push and pull that Democrats are dealing with. And so the question really comes down to, Who can make the clearest kind of messaging argument to make the gambit of trying to ratchet back uh, the allowances here politically toxic for those who would want to do so? And that's part of why talking in terms of $2,000 checks was such a boon for those who were trying to get more for Americans. It's a similar case that can be made for a $15 minimum wage, which overwhelming majorities of Americans support, which we saw won on the ballot in Florida, even where Joe Biden lost. And it's frustrating to see again and again that Democrats who want to try to maximize the amount of benefits that are going to Americans aren't taking opportunities of the rhetorical footholds that are available in some of these really clear, easy to understand, enormously popular plans. Yeah, and I think that, that the point is is that when you promise somebody $2,000, and it's already been lowered, okay, et cetera, but then you lower the threshold. I mean, you may, you're basically opening yourself right for a tax. I said this this morning. Like, if a Republican does beat Warnock or Ossoff, they're going to be like, they promised you this money and they didn't give it to you, and I will, you know, or they don't even have to say, I'll give it to you. They'll be like, they said they would do this, and they didn't. It's a very politically, you know, it's a very politically important tool. Yeah, and remember this. Remember the CARES Act when something like $250 billion was funneled upward to big businesses with no condition that they actually keep people on the payroll? Again, that was the whole point of COVID, to keep people on the payroll mm-hmm. to enable them to stay home and survive this pandemic. We're t- what we're talking about now with the the, 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 re- the Republican bipartisan plan with the, 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 the 10 Republicans are willing to buy into this is a cost savings of about that much, 
right? About that much. And there was no talk of conditions. We were talking about giving enormous amounts to big businesses who did nothing to pull their weight and help us through this pandemic. Instead, we're talking about means testing as always for the people who have the least among us. And instead, what we should be talking about in this moment, arguably, is a wealth tax to try to pull back some of the money that was not only given out indiscriminately earlier in the co course of the COVID pandemic, but also the $1.7 trillion tax cuts, 83% of which went to the 1%. Um, we're talking about Donald Trump's tax cuts in 2017. The money is there. It's just been given to the absolutely wrong people, and we shouldn't be nicking, nickeling and diming everyday Americans. Yeah. I also feel like Democrats have this weird obsession with doing programs that no one like notices has benefited them. <laughs> Whereas like if you're a Republican, that probably makes sense because you're doing things that are dramatically unpopular on the economic front. So you kind of want to like sneak them in and subtly shape the landscape. But Democrats always do this thing where they're, you know, let's do it as a tax credit. Like people, sure, people really want the checks, but we know better and we're going to means test it and we're going to do it with this other program that they won't even notice existed. We saw this really clearly in the Obama administration with their relief bill, their stimulus bill, which was woefully inadequate from just an overall dollars and cents perspective, but also I think a third of it was tax cuts. Um, they had had this program, planned to have this program to upgrade all the schools. They got talked down of that. That would have been a really super noticeable thing in people's communities. Everything was designed so that you barely noticed that the money had actually been spent, which it doesn't just matter as like a political messaging tool, but it also matters if you want to make an affirmative case that government can positive, positively impact people's lives and have them believe in that process again. Yeah, the left often talks about how it has less power today than it did 50 years ago because of decline of union membership and engagement from the labor sector. But it is also true that the Democratic Party has demonstrated over the last 50 years that it is increasingly unable or unwilling to deliver the kind of big ticket items that attracted that kind of support to begin with, on top of obviously the attacks on labor laws that have facilitated that process. So look at FDR. That's a candidate, a, a president that was so popular that they literally couldn't get him out of office until he actually died, right? Winning term after term after term, sweeping every state in the union almost, uh, uh, with the exception, the kind of hilarious exception of Vermont there. You know, <laughs> when you actually give people things, when they actually feel it in their pocketbook, Voters are smart enough, savvy enough to understand that and to remember it. And we have deluded ourselves, I think, politicians have at least, into thinking that, Repu that uh, voters rather are too silly to know what's good for them, too silly to appreciate when they're being given something good. And that is being used as an excuse, frankly, not to deliver and to act like political outcomes are completely up in the air and not something that is able to be controlled by the people who are really in power. Yeah, I think that's 100% right. Thank you, Brianna. Great to see you, Bri. Same here. Coming up, Ryan Gerdusky discusses allegations against the Lincoln Project's John Weaver. That one rising returns.